Anybody got any questions or anything that they really wanted to work on here this morning? Anything particular floating through anybody's mind? Bob. Happy to be here instead of at the farm today. Um, I was thinking about in the past all kinds of people's people have made promises to do things. They didn't do it. Is there anything in the Bible that equates unkept promises with lies? Uh, the Bible's pretty clear. When you make a vow, you keep it. You know, it talks about uh, a man who swears to his own hurt. That is, he makes a deal, keeps it. God is not happy when people break their word, and it kind of runs all the way through. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, just real quick on this. One one example, you know, the Old Testament, uh, Jephthah, the uh, the judge, you know, he he made a vow that, you know, when he if God would give him victory, the first thing that came out of his house, he'd offer as a sacrifice to God. And so he's coming back, and his daughter, I think she's about 8 or 10, maybe a little older, uh, comes out of the house. She's the first thing that greets him. And so he, you know, he lets her have a period of mourning, and then he sacrifices her because that was the vow that was kept. In Matthew 5, Jesus kind of warns about this. In uh, verse 33, <clears throat> Matthew 5, 33, he says, Again, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false, 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 false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. See, vows, oaths, swearing, you know, and swearing doesn't, it's kind of come to mean <coughs> cussing or cursing, but, you know, it, it originally started out, okay, I'm, I'm calling upon God here, I'm testifying to you in the sight of God, I'm going to do this. Of course, we still use that in the legal sense, you know, it's when a person's testifying, they're spoken of it as under oath. See, that is, they've, they've sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I uh, used to actually put a hand on the Bible, because that would mean you're really cursed if you, if you swore and, and didn't tell the, tell the truth. <clears throat> but God, Jesus says, I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem. For it's the city of the great king, nor shall you mo make an oath by your head, if you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond these is of evil. And we turn to James <coughs> chapter 5. A similar, <coughs> similar type of thought, James 5.12. <coughs> He says, but above all, my brethren, James 5, 12, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Because the idea is when people started making an oath after a while, that just, that you use that to cover up and then after a while it becomes a means by which you punctuate your thoughts. And Jesus said, okay, let's, <clears throat> let's just bring it back. If you're going to say something, say it. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no, and you don't have to put a string of profanity in there, you know, to, to emphasize it. So uh, that's how committed to God is, is, is your word is your word. And of course, the, you know, in the American West, <clears throat> you know, that was a key point. Uh, you know, you, <clears throat> you know, like uh, <clears throat> uh, Conrad Kors <clears throat> operating out of Deer Lodge there, he was running cattle all over eastern Montana, <clears throat> and I think Charlie Russell was actually working for, for Coors in the big blizzard of 1887, 1888, well, the big winter. What happens is it came in, and it uh, <clears throat> snowed heavy, and then it melted just kind of like this year. Okay, then now you got ice underneath, and then came in snow over the top of it. Well, horses can kind of paw <clears throat> down through the ice, but cows, the way they're their hooves are, they can't. And so Conrad Coors wanted to know, you know, how, how the herd was in the spring, and Charlie Russell, I think it was on a napkin, he 
<coughs> he drew one <coughs> oh, poor old cow. You know, there's a couple of skeletons showing up in the back. And, you know, and uh, <coughs> basically, the, you know, the, the, I think the title was Waiting for a Chinook or The Last of the 5,000 or something like that. But, you know, the, <coughs> the, the, that's, that's where they quit open range and started running with uh, fences and, and hay because they, they realized that they couldn't keep doing what they were doing. <coughs> you know, Conrad Coors went down to the bank <coughs> and just on his word, borrowed the equivalent of millions <coughs> to refinance. See, and that was typical in, in well, Western states, you know, that a man's word was his bond. And you could be called a lot of things, but if you were, if you were called a liar, you could see why, <coughs> you know, that I mean, that was your your a liar or cowards, you know, <laughs> those are the worst. But you can see how much that's changed, you know, to where we are now. And uh, so that's why Jesus says, "Look, it. If you're going to make a statement, make it. Okay. If you if you make a commitment, keep it. Okay. If if you make a mistake in making your commitment, keep it. See." You know, make sure your word's good. And that's, that's the biblical principle. What's that pointing to? It's pointing to the fact that God's spoken, right? You know, in John chapter 10, in verse 35, here's Jesus' comment on that. Right in the middle of the verse, or the end of the verse, John 10, 35, in parentheses, Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. The point is, God gave his word. You're not retracting it. And uh, he's going to keep it. And uh, no exceptions. So, thank you. Any further comment, Bob? Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Elliot. Okay. Anybody else got a comment on that? Yeah, Luke. Thank you. So, I uh, I've thought about this a fair amount, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, of course, Paul has some initial plans, and the question comes up, some of the, some of his opposition are trying to basically go after him any way they can, you know, vacillating, yes, yes, no, no, but I guess one of the things I've, I've thought about in reference to that is when people swear you by whatever authority bigger than yourself, you're almost saying you're in charge of circumstances that are beyond your control. So we say yes, and we follow through on that, but also s sometimes there are circumstances that legitimately are beyond our control that, that cause plans to have to change. And is that also a reason why, I mean, I guess James 4, if the Lord wills, yep. we shall live or also do this or that. But I guess, I don't know if there's a, if I'm connecting the dots right or if there's any further explanation on that. Yeah, I mean, it was a dumb oath on Jephthah's part, you know, because, you know, I'm sure he's anticipating, you know, I don't know, maybe the pet lamb or something to, to come out the door. But, uh, see, you know, you, you got to think those things through. So if, like in Paul's case there in Second Corinthians, he, pro he said he was coming to Corinth, but he didn't get there, okay? And you see that sometimes in the book of Acts. He's trying to get into Ephesus, but, but God actually blocks him from getting there. See, so there's got to be you know, elements there. And uh, so sometimes when you, when you swear, you know, so to speak, and make that oath, then you're, in effect, putting God on the line for something that God doesn't necessarily want to be on the line for. Yeah. So now God has sworn, you know, if you go to, Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 4. 1000 BC, he says, The Lord has sworn, see, and will not change his mind, referring to Jesus, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. See, but he doesn't swear very often. And so, like the scripture says, since God could swear by no one greater than himself, greater, he swore by himself, you know, and to Abraham, he said, blessing, I will bless you, you know, and to here, he says, uh, 
the Lord has sworn will not change his mind. You're, not, you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, um, but God doesn't swear very often, so when he does, you know, you want to pay attention because that's letting you know he has 100% commitment to what he's going to make happen. So, further comment, Mr. Luke Wilson? Okay. Mr. Hoffman. One of the things with the story of Jephthah that really struck me is that the daughter also supported mm -hmm. his oath, and I thought that was pretty amazing. She just asked for a little time to mourn her virginity, yeah. that she's never going to be the <clears throat> mother of the Savior. But um, the other thought was uh, just this week we're swearing in, or last week swearing in, people into Congress, and one of them chose to be sworn in with his hand on a Superman comic book. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is his oath worth? Yeah. Well, uh, we already know the answer to that one, Jerry. Uh, but see, again, America was founded on biblical principles. And so, you know, the Jewish prudence system, see, is based on the idea that you're taking an oath in the sight of God to tell the truth, and you put your hand on the Bible. See, well, particularly the Biden administration more than any other uh, has the sordid collection of weirdos in there because it's the process of overthrowing the existing social order. See, when you got the, the people and, say, the chiefs of staff like they have, the head of the military, uh, that type of people that they got, you know, it's, it's a deliberate overthrow of the existing social order. And so when these guys are using the comic book, see, that, you know, they're, they're actually mocking the the foundational institutions of America, and that lets you know again they're <clears throat> they have a clear agenda. You know the the Democrats in Congress are united. I mean, once they have made, you know Joe Manchin's about the you know, only guy that ever dissents from the party line, a senator from West Virginia. <clears throat> See that lets you know that they are a committed Marxist block <clears throat> that operates under orders. Okay, um, a, a number of the Republicans are are actually secretly on the same side, so you have you have to know that going in. So they're again their intent is to overthrow the existing social order. So when you had the the, the twenty guys that were initially narrowed down to six opposing the uh, Kevin McCarthy nomination is the uh, Speaker of the House, okay, these guys are constitutionalists. Say, so look, we got to follow the Constitution. Okay, they're called extremists, they're called terrorists, and they're called insurrectionists for supporting the Constitution. Okay, that gives you an idea where we're at. Now, the thing about a communist, a communist always calls his opposition what he personally is. Okay, so that lets you know if they're calling these guys extremists, insurrectionists, and terrorists, that lets you know what they are. And so they basically got control of the federal government, the, the swamp, and, and Congress, and definitely the Supreme Court. So don't expect, <clears throat> don't expect any major turnarounds here. Just continue to get your spiritual life in order and continue to make progress spiritually because... Ultimately, that's all you got. You don't know when all the rest of this can come crashing down. Okay. Elliot. There we go. So, in uh, First Corinthians... Oh. <laughs> Almost dropped my Bible there. Okay, here we go. So, in First Corinthians 6... Uh, there's a big part of the chapter that uh, basically it, it talks about this, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? In verse 2, uh, the world is judged by you. Uh, we shall judge angels in verse 3. Um, in verse 4, do you not appoint them as judges who are of no account, or do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? So my understanding of the first couple of verses, at least, of us judging the world is through our purity, that contrast is what judges the world, not specifically like a Christian judging 
the world. But I am also wondering um, if you have any like insight on that and what the what the whole thing is with Christians judging other Christians within the bounds of the church and within the bounds of the scripture. How does that all work? Well, in the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you had a situation where pretty clearly immoral, a man was living with his father's wife, and uh, the church didn't act on it. In fact, the church was split into a lot of factions, and you can see that the way that the guys were getting to the top and the factions was by curry and favor with the guys who, like this one, um, who was living that totally immoral life and uh, was going, you know, was bound and determined to continue. And so, um, because the the church didn't act in that case, okay, and um, Paul said that he was going to sit in judgment. In verse 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, he said, I have uh, decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay, So <clears throat> the way he expressed it in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you're assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of this, our Lord Jesus. So that's constant, consistent with uh, Matthew 18, verses 15 through about 21. So... In verse 12, 1 Corinthians 5.12, he says, What do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those within the church? But those who are on the outside, God judges. And then he says, Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So the, the idea of this type of judgment here is, okay, I remember talking to Monroe Calipo in the Philippines, and uh, the Filipino families tend to stay right where they are for, for generations. And so you know, what's called a barangay is, uh, you know, these guys have known each other for, for generations. So I asked Monroe, I says, do you know who the thieves are? <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, we know. Okay. I says, do you know who, who, who the liars are? Yeah, we know. See, the, the character uh, is, is known. And that's, you know, in human interactions, you know, after a while, you get a pretty good idea. Uh, you, nobody says much most of the time, but you get a pretty good idea who's what and where they fit. Okay, and so when you have a situation that's way out of bounds and and the church doesn't do anything about it, in this case Paul had to step in. So we have some instructions here to judge those who are within the church and to do it in consistency with uh, Matthew chapter 18. Okay, you don't just get to arbitrarily you know, start making some judgments, that's, that, not, that doesn't work very good. And you, if you're going to start down the Matthew 18 pass it, um, process, then you better know what you're doing, and, uh, you know, you better be prepared to go all the way to the end, okay? So the result is, is if you have to boot somebody out of the church, they're on the outside, right? Okay, and God judges the outsiders, doesn't he? And it's not going to be a pleasant judgment, so, John chapter 3, you know, when, when uh, Pharaoh is talking to, to Joseph about his, Joseph's brothers coming down, he said, if you know of any capable men among them, he says, put them in charge of my livestock, okay? So, there's a recognition that, you know, there's, People have different levels of capability, and, and uh, you know, you've you got to assess that properly, okay? In uh, verse John three seventeen, Jesus said, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So anybody that's uh, not properly immersed into Christ has been judged already. 
Okay, that's, you know, and that's what Jesus saw. So he said Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world because he knew what the condition of the world was. It's lost. So he came to step in and, and save the world is what he came to do. So, you know, that's, that's how judging people goes. I mean, sometimes inside the church we have to do certain things. Outside the church, everybody's lost. No, that's the judgment, all right? And as you pointed out earlier this morning, Elliot, we're, we're trying to reach into the world and, you know, help them change that position. Well, what about judging angels? Okay. By the way, it's, it's not really our purity that judges the world. It's our faith. Okay. See, it's, that's, that's an important, important distinction here. Uh, the goal is, of course, to be pure as he is pure. But there's a lot of Christians that don't, don't get that far. They don't live long enough. You know, I, I figure you have to live to at least 145 probably to <laughs> some, sometimes maybe get there. But uh, the, so it's our faith, actually, that, uh, that's actually judging the world, uh, not our, not our, our purity. Because that, that's what God's looking for, according to First Peter 1, is our faith. So what about judging angels, okay? Second um, Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2, 4. It says, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them literally into Tartarus and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Okay? And Jude chapter 1, it's talking about the evil angels. Spirit and angel are equivalents. You know, they're not equivalent words, but they're equivalent beings. So an evil spirit is also a fallen angel. In uh, Jude 1 and verse 6, he said, Angels who did, not keep, who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Okay. So what's going to happen? You know, we have a picture of that in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 and verse 10. <clears throat> and the de devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So what does it mean that we shall be judging angels? Once again, it's our faith. See, because we're going to be justified by what? Our faith. You know, he, you know, the scripture repeatedly says that, uh, you know, it's our faith is what is valuable to God. Now, faith, if it has no action, isn't real faith. Do we need a couple more chairs? So, so our faith is what God's really looking for. And it's our faith is the basis on which he honors us. See, faithful, right, until death. See that? So because of that, then at the end, and how he works this, you'll know, if you turn to Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 and uh, verse 20. The phraseology he, here to me is interesting. The God of peace. Who, who, who is this? Oh, it's the God of peace. What's he going to do? He's going to crush Satan <laughs> under your feet, okay? Under our feet. See, this looks to me like this is how this judgment is being executed here on the devil and his angels. That the picture is, is that, you know, we, you know, crushed under our feet. You know, it's, it's a way of exalting, elevating us, honoring us for the fact that we are able to maintain our faith regardless of, of the difficulties. 
and personally have victory over Satan and personally have victory over uh, the forces of darkness, um, all the angelic beings. And uh, so he's going to honor us. And so that, I think, is what's expressed in 1 Corinthians 6 of judging angels. See, it's ultimately our faith is what God's going to do to, you know. And so when we go this away and Satan and his angels go that away, that's a pretty good final judgment. More than that, we don't have details on. Anything else, Elliot? Okay. Anybody else got a comment on that? So Psalm, Psalm 149, the end of it, it's the same idea. Yeah. It's, really, it's actually really fun, encouraging, actually, to think about. Why don't you read that section there? Sure. Psalm 149. I guess I'll do five through the end of that. Psalm 149, verse 5. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on, the, vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their no, nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. Yep. Yeah. See, and, and notice what's in our hands. The two-edged sword thing. See, so, you know, ultimately it's, it's, again, just us doing what we're supposed to do, you know. Faith, a faithful individual is where he's supposed to be, doing what he's supposed to be doing with the attitude he's supposed to be doing it with. See, that, it, it's that simple. And uh, so, you know, and we know when we're someplace we're not supposed to be, you know. We know when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we know when we don't have the attitude <laughs> we're supposed to be doing it with, right? So... You know, God expects us to, to get those things in order, but when we do that, we judge the world and we judge uh, the evil angels as well. So, another question this morning. Jack. Squeeze around here, Bo. Thanks. Just uh, a comment on questions a couple back. Um, so, we're we're told, you know, yes, let your yes be yes and your no's be no's. Um, and we always know that when God says something, it's, it's, it's what it is. It's, it's a fact right there. And you said that there's few occasions where he's sworn. Um, when he does that, is that kind of just a warning to us, like, hey, get it together, get it done, kind of just really letting, letting that be for, uh, for us and not for him? Well, partly. That, that's a good point you got. But it's interesting the type of things he swears on, okay? Um, let's go to Hebrews 6. A little bit of Hebrews 6 is tough to sort out, but um, Hebrews 6 and verse 13 says, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. Okay. Literally in the Hebrew, it's, you know, blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply you. When, when those words are doubled up, that's an oath. See, it's, it's interesting to see what, what God has sworn here in the case of Abraham is really the future coming of the church. See, the future descendants of Abraham. In uh, Hebrews 7, in verse 21, says the Old Testament priest, the priest of the order of Aaron, became priest without an oath, but Jesus with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So, the, it's interesting that one place where God swore has to do with the church. The other place where he swore had to do with Jesus being exalted to the high priest and the other things. So the, it doesn't look like it's so much like get your act together. 
it's the, like, like God is, I am committed to this, and I am committed to this. See, well, it makes sense to see Jesus and the church. See, the bridegroom and the bride. See, it would be the two things that he would swear about. So, any other comments on that? Okay. Anybody else? Okay, one more question. Okay, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Kind of a general, overall big picture thing I've been gnawing on lately. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you see, you know, a dog, you know, that's that's kind of kind of how my word, mind mind works. It just keeps gnawing on stuff. First uh, Corinthians one twenty one. It says, "In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God." For sin, see, I got to go back. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Okay, and we've talked about it before, uh, but I want to expand on it a little bit this morning. Um, man can, by his combination of observation and reason, he can learn a lot about the material realm. And so, the, you know, I mean, it starts out, you know, if you watch little boys, particular little boys are always running experiments, okay? Sometimes experiments that don't make their moms have very happy, you know, it's just like, huh, did you get in that much mud? You know, it's, but uh, that's, you know, they're, you know, they're, it's kind of the way God made the male mind a little bit, uh, kind of be running experiments, be checking things out, and see, and that's, you know, all those experiments eventually resulted in, in the science that we know. I was talking to my son Mark, uh, the other yesterday, I guess, and uh, you know, he's he works for a, a Honeywell plant in uh, in Spokane, and they they make the uh, the layered silica chips, and then inlay you know gold and copper and different things at a micro level. He was telling me that that some of the lines that they lay down are one atom wide. Man, that, is, that, that you know, I mean, that's tremendous technology, see? And, of course, a lot of that has resulted, you know, I mean, you think about it. My grandma, Nell McGuire, you know, she lived to be 99. She was born in 1887, I think. And, uh, you know, she said, I went from man in a buggy to man on the moon. You know, I mean, she told me, she remembered when, when the first horseless carriages started coming down the streets, okay, and uh, upsetting all the horses, okay. <laughs> and uh, so what you've seen is you've tre- mean a tremendous exponential growth in technology. I mean, so much so that we can't even hardly fathom it. And uh, again, a, a trip or two through the computer museum, it, it helps. I mean, I, I, I've mentioned before, when you're looking at what you're seeing in the computer museum, you are not processing what you're seeing. You're not. Difficult to, you know. Just uh, another point. When I was uh, started in, in uh, MSU in uh, the fall of 1965, they had... Uh, a mainframe, an IBM mainframe that used Fortran language, and we used to have to write our computer programs out, you know, little block letters, and then somebody would type those into keys, and then they run these cards through. Well, the next year, they got a big, uh, what was called Sigma 7 computer, and it filled the entire basement. If you ever seen the MSU library, that is a big building, filled the entire basement of the of the of the library huge computer that's 1967 and they were able to set up you know stations around campus like for us engineer types and we could go to a station and we could uh, put our programs in in, the, in basic language and and do some computer work that we needed to do okay that's a big computer and it wasn't the only computer that big in 1967 okay there there were others you know, across the country, probably nearly every university. There's more computer power 
in this cell phone than there was in all the computers together in 1967. Can't process that. You honestly cannot process that. And so, see, the nanotechnology that's developed, um, you know, that's down there in the billions of the billions type of thing. Uh, I think 10 to the minus 9. Uh, see, we can't, we can't even fathom how fast this has accelerated here. See, that's all that is, is man's reason coupled with man's observation. Now, one little caveat I'll throw in there. I think God has helped that out at times, okay? I, okay, but so that's man's reason, man's observation, okay? What's this tell you about God? Only thing that tells you about God, if you're honest, is he is very orderly. Okay, that's, only, that's basically the only thing it tells you. <clears throat> the law of gravity, right? Gravity is what? You guys remember this? Gravitational constant, mass 1, mass 2, over, we'll call it d squared, okay? Inflexible. If you know the mass of Jupiter, <laughs> and you know the mass of Earth, and you know the distance, you can calculate the amount of gravity that uh, Jupiter is exerting on the Earth goes by. Um, the sun's gravity, see the gravitational, sun's about a million times as big as the Earth, so mass one here and mass two, it's, you know. But that's, that's, what, that's gravitational force strong enough to keep the Earth, you know, in the orbit around the sun. Okay, so you can calculate that. Um, Electricity loss, um, momentum, you know, all these natural laws, you know, depending on how you calculate it, you know, say 27 to somewhere around 50 natural laws that are actually orderly, inflexible, right? That's all it tells you. So how is God going to get the knowledge of who he is into the world? See, he honestly wants us to know him. So if you go to John 17, Jesus explains why he came into the world. Remember, we landed at the Philippines, and I think Mikkel was with me this, this trip, but I'm not sure. After a while, Gary, unfortunately, it all runs together. <laughs> I just have to say that I owe Gary my life a couple times over, so, you know, <laughs> Good to have each other. You know, you got to have somebody you trust on those international trips, okay? Because, you know, they either save your life or say, uh, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> so, um, in John 17, 1, Jesus in his prayer, uh, I remember stepping off the plane and, and uh, there were some people that were going to get immersed. And so, you know, I came over and, and gave a little speech alongside the pool. And this is what I use because I didn't want him just, quote, getting baptized. You know, I mean, just getting baptized, what, even baptized for the remission of sins, okay? Is that, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. So in John 17, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you've given him, he may give eternal life. Now, this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. You know, I've got a video that somebody gave us. It's called uh, How to Know God. See? Well, I've never really taken the time to look at the video because I know the guy that made the video doesn't know how to know God. Okay? Because... You know, to know God, you've got to be immersed into Christ. You've got to have the right faith system in order to, be, to know God, or as Paul would put it, rather to be known by him. So the goal is for, God, for us to know God. God's goal is for us to be able to know him, who he is. All right? Now, we're not going to get that by observing the world. 
See, God was well pleased, see, that his, the, the world through its knowledge isn't going to know God. It's going to take the injection of information, <coughs> the technical term for that being revelation, it's going to take the inf- injection of information by God into the world in order to do that. Now, <coughs> God's got a real careful balance here that he's got to maintain when he does that. See, he can overpower man. And um, <clears throat> so what does that do? Well, it scares him, okay? Uh, he's got to do it in such a way as that man has to be reaching for it a little bit. It has to be something that man wants. And so the Bible, of course, in general, <clears throat> is the careful means by which God has injected this information into the world. So it starts out pretty interesting. Let's go back to... Uh, to uh, Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> Genesis 2.15. <clears throat> then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Edom to cultivate it and keep it. <clears throat> and the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Okay. So God's got some communication going on with man here. Okay. Um, God put man to sleep and uh, took a rib and fashioned a woman. And so man and woman are standing there in the Garden of Eden and uh, the job to, to cultivate it and keep it. Okay. And to keep keep away from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, in chapter three, then of course we have the interaction between Satan and Eve, and so she eats the fruit. And in she in verse five, uh, she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And so they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the, his wife hid themselves from the presence of God, Lord God, in the trees of the garden. <coughs> now, why are they hiding? Well, they're expecting him to come. See, however long this happened, you can tell that God's actually walking with them in the Garden of Eden and having whatever communication he's having directly with them. Okay. And, of course, as that communication continued and and Eve made her excuse, and Adam made his excuse. Uh, God cursed uh, the woman, saying that, uh, you know, your husband's going to rule over you, and that can be a curse, depending on your husband, can be a blessing. Uh, or, uh, and in pain, you're going to give birth to children, and, uh, you know, that's apparently pretty, you know, never experienced it myself. I've been working on my gender, and... Uh, Trying to get my pronouns correct. I think it's still he and him, you know, and his. That I think those are my pronouns. Uh, I think there's those, those are God's preferred pronouns in the English language. I think that's what those are. Uh, so I've never experienced that pain. I've been around when it's been experienced, but uh, never experienced it. So, you know, you ladies will have to speak to that. <coughs> Man, the curse is, is he's going to earn his living from ground that's cursed. I need, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, in case you're wondering, this really is vinegar and honey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's vinegar and honey. Yeah. Um, so, Adam's cursed uh, because uh, He's going to have to work hard. Uh, the way I put it, he's going to have to ju- have to hack the jungle back every day in order to stay even, much less get ahead. And that curse has never been removed. One of the great blessings in heaven is there's no more curse. See? And so, <clears throat> you know, and that's our experience, okay? Nothing fits, okay? The parts are late. You know, the window broke. You know, the kids messed everything up. 
you know, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, we call it the second law of thermodynamics, and that's, uh, you know, at least that's one aspect of it. But the fact is that, you know, our, our life is carried out through very difficult situations. Okay. Again, we've, we've got it pretty easy, uh, have had it pretty easy in our country. I don't know about you guys, but <coughs> I left my car in the garage overnight. Um, I don't know, rolled her out this morning and, and uh, let her warm up, you know, uh, push the button for a heated steering wheel, uh, push the button for heated seats for Katie, and, uh, you know, which she appreciates, and because uh, it's a lot of effort on my part to reach over and punch that button, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to know how much work I do on her behalf, you know, for her comfort, but, but you know, drove out here. Let's, let's go back to, say, 1890, all right? And you're going to come to assembly on Lord's Day morning at this building, okay? Uh, how many of you here live within five miles of the building? Within, okay, five miles. How many live within 10 miles? How many live within 15? How many within 20, okay? How long would it take you to do five miles? You'll hook up the team to the buckboard, maybe an hour, right? Okay, that's that's how it used to be when they attend assembly. You know, attend assembly, hook up the buckboard, and and uh, you know, zero degrees coming across Penwell Bridge or one degree above zero this morning. You know, that's the way it was. Okay, so you finish assembly, what? <coughs> an hour back, two hours maybe. I know it's nine miles from where we live to here. So, <clears throat> okay. See, we have to sometimes process a little bit uh, some of the challenges and some of the difficulties that <clears throat> most people had before this exponential curve started kicking in here. And uh, the difficulty of travel, the difficulty of communication, <clears throat> all the things that go along with it. And cold, okay. You know, always cold. This time you're always cold. Question. Yeah. Did they still come to assembly back then? Oh, right. <laughs> Katie's dad did. You know, he's how how many miles away from the assembly was it for you guys? Three, four, three miles. Okay, three miles. Okay, whatever he was doing, he stopped her. And uh, he, he taught the adult class. And uh, you guys never hardly ever missed, did you? No. Nope. Later on when they had vehicles, they used to throw Katie in the back seat, uh, the back in the trunk. If the trunk opened the vehicle. <laughs> okay. You know, you got to understand. The t I want you, Katie lived, you know, she gr grew up sleeping on a, what was called a tick. And uh, once a year, they put fresh straw in the tick. Okay, and uh, no, no, no complaining. That's you know, it's the way it was. And uh, see, you can see that boy. There's been a lot of changes. I remember reading an article in the Reader's Digest one time. I, I was reading this article in about 1955, and because uh, my folks used to get the Reader's Digest, and this is an old guy, and he's probably about 75 or thereabouts would be my guess, and uh, he. Uh, but he was talking about what it was like before the turn of the century. And he said, the first thing that you would notice is how much everything smelled. He said, that's the first thing. You know. Okay, because who took a shower every day in 1890? They didn't. And, you know, <clears throat> uh, once a week would be a big stretch. Okay, so... You know, any body odor issues? See, my dad used to cut hair for an old cow herder by the name of Kenny Parent, you know, left up North Meadow Creek. And, uh, you know, he'd come in twice a year to get his hair cut. And my mom, she'd fumigate the house <laughs> every time he left because, uh, you know, I'm sure you remember that. And, uh, you know, because old Kenny, he took a bath, I think, once or twice a year. Which was, okay, that, that's how it was. 
That's how it was. You know, it wasn't, wasn't unusual. He was just, he was just a little bit of a holdover. See? So sometimes we got to process how easy we have it and try to get used to pain. That, you know, as, as things move forward, we're going to have to get used to a lot more pain and, 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 and no whining about it either. See, because, like I say, we've got a lot of comforts that we just don't even think about, we take for granted. But that God allowed this to happen for some, some good reasons. You talk about the advent of the automobile about 1915. There was probably as many Fords on the road as the rest of them together. But they were all hand cranked, no electric start. A lot of them had acetylene headlights. You'd have to get out and put water in a generator to make acetylene gas, but that wouldn't work in the wintertime. And to start the car, you would generally build a fire. It was really cold. You'd build a fire under the oil pan to warm the oil enough to get the engine to turn. And then you jack up the rear wheel so the drag from the differential and transmission wouldn't be more than what you could hand crank. But you got to remember, there were no antifreezes for a long time. And the ones that did come were full of alcohol. And the alcohol would boil out. So what you would do is preheat the probably three and a half gallons of water on the stove and then go dump it in the radiator and hope it didn't freeze in the process before the car was going. And then the heater consisted of hot rocks out of the stove. Yep. Okay. That's with the automobile. Okay. Bill? My bed consisted of hot bricks yeah. when I went to bed yep. to keep my feet warm. Yep. <laughs> See, sometimes... They say things get lost along the way. <clears throat> so, so God did this, you know, and, and he wants us to understand that, that all of this, this technology has, has an important purpose, but, you know, that, that can come to an end. But my point I'm making here in Genesis is God actually walked with Adam and Eve. God talked to him. Okay, so he's given him what? He's injecting information into the system. That's, that's where it began. In Genesis chapter 4, when it uh, comes time for Cain and Abel to offer their sacrifices, uh, God had no regard for Cain and his offering. That's interesting. And uh, so Cain became very angry. His countenance fell in verse 5. Verse 6, the Lord said, he's having direct communication with Cain. Why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin's crouching at the door, and it's desires for you, but you must master it. See, God's injecting more information in here. One of the, things it's, one of the points he's injecting here is the idea that uh, sin is your choice. <coughs> sin is your choice. You, you choose to sin, <coughs> that's your choice. You, you choose righteousness, that's your choice. And... Uh, the Lord talked to Cain, said, where's Abel? It, you know, Cain said, I don't know, you know, not my brother's keeper. And so there's a little communication there. See, but you can see as the family of God expands, God expects them to be aware of that direct communication that took place. See, none of Adam and Eve's family can claim that they didn't know that God existed. None of Adam and Eve's direct family could claim that they did not know that God did not interact directly with man. See, now, what he said was very, very limited, you know, very, very, very elementary. So the next example is, you know, um, basically Enoch uh, walking with God, and he's gone, God took him. But see, again, that the family knew that. See, the next piece of information we have is Noah preaching. See, by this time, the family's an estimated two to two and a half billion. Okay? And Noah's, Noah's called a preacher of righteousness. See, and you can tell, what's he doing? He's just trying to call them to repentance, right? So <coughs> they can't claim ignorance. And so the next communication that God had was uh, called rain and fountains of the deep. Okay? That was major communication. So... When Noah and his family stepped off the ark, and the, the family, as it continued to move down to, you know, the plain uh, where they're going to build the Tower of Babel, they can't claim they don't know. 
See, God has injected information here all the way along. Uh, now, it's pretty elementary or rudimentary, but uh, he's injecting information, and he's, and he's step by step bringing man along. So that's one of the things we want to follow here in a little bit and uh, see where that leads. Mill? Talk about technology. I have a cell phone that works perfectly, but the providers for the service, it's been down for two weeks. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mills, anybody else having that same experience? Okay, so Mills got a cell phone, works perfectly, provider's down. Yep. <clears throat> infrastructure, right? What happens when man gets dependent on infrastructure? And the infrastructure goes down. Got to think about it. <clears throat> 